Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history or society or our culture. And in our ongoing series on Nobel Prize winners, tonight we're going to talk about Professor James Mirlis, who died recently at the age of 82. Professor Mirlis was awarded one half of the 1996 Nobel Prize in Economics, along with William Vickery, for their fundamental contributions to the economic theory of incentives under asymmetric information. They did groundbreaking work on economic incentives in situations involving incomplete or asymmetrical information, and their specialization was optimal taxation. Okay, so while their stuff gets fairly complex, the question behind it is fairly simple. Is there an optimal tax rate? What is it, and how do you determine it? He was looking to balance the fact that onerous tax rates as there were in Britain in the mid-1960s, would often provide a disincentive to people to work, but at the same time you had to balance that against the fact that you needed a sufficient tax rate to provide for the public good. Some of his other work revolved around the concept of informational asymmetry, where one party in a transaction has more information than the other party in a transaction. This is related to the work of economist Ken Arrow, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics, and we did his podcast about a year ago, and I refer you to it. I should also mention that Professor Vickery, who split the Nobel Prize in Economics with Professor Mirlees, died three days after the prize was announced in 1996. Professor Mirlees was a nice Scottish boy from southwestern Scotland, born in the little Scottish town of Minigath. He was very good at math. He taught himself calculus as a teenager, and he went on to study mathematics at the University of Edinburgh. He later went on to Cambridge, and when he became a professor, he spent most of his professional life between Cambridge and Oxford. One of his mentors at Cambridge was Amartya Sen, who was the Nobel Prize winning economist in 1998, who arranged for him to go to India for a year where he studied, and part of that time was spent at MIT here in the United States. So even though he came from a small town in Scotland, Professor Mirlees actually had a fairly broad academic background. Here in an interview, Professor Mirlees talks about the area that he won the Nobel Prize for, optimal taxation. Optimal taxes, which is what I got very interested in professionally. When I um, had the, the sort of uh, little film interview that they, they do after the, the prize as part of the general film, the cameraman on that occasion said to me as we were walking across the court in Trinity, since uh, the taxes you pay are, are going to be spent on, on things that the government does, which are, are good things like the health service, education, and, and so on, which you surely value too. Doesn't doesn't that mean that you should be very happy to pay taxes and there should be no incentive problem? Uh, so I thought that was a nice argument, and I, I liked it, and I wish that people felt like that about, <laughs> about taxes. Uh, but of course, the, the work I've done has mainly been recognizing that people do not feel like that about taxes, and uh, that it apparently even got to the point of discouraging quite a lot of people from earning as much as they might have, which in particular means that they no longer pay as many taxes as they should. And I, I suppose that I, I'm forced to see that high tax rates do induce quite a lot of people to find ways of avoiding them, mm -hmm. or evading them. And I think that's also part of it. In the Western countries, still the total tax take is pretty high, and, uh, and I think on the whole it's going up again in, in most countries. And that's for perfectly straightforward reasons, that uh, more and more is needed for things that, uh, at least in, in Europe, the state does, like education, which is necessarily something that gets more expensive and in very notable in Britain the health service we spend the rate at which we spend on the health is going up a great deal and I think that's pretty much the, the picture in the, in the European countries as well and I, actually I'm not as concerned as lots of people are about the marginal tax rates which they think are quite high it can, in effect in most of the European countries the total marginal tax rates over 50%, that's to say, add on other taxes like VAT to, to the income tax. So yes, people are paying a rather large proportion of their, their income above the basic um, to the government to, to use for this and that. 
Uh, but I, I suppose I don't quite understand why they don't think they're getting a lot of it back, because actually a lot of the benefits do accrue to the, to the better off as well. And then there are lots and lots of people in the country who are not so well off. Mm -hmm. And I would think uh, clearly a majority of the population are getting or can expect to get more out of the system than they're putting in the taxation. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's about. It's, it's about uh, ensuring that the things that uh, are needed for everybody, certain basic things which cannot be conveniently left to people to buy for themselves, be available for everyone, but they are mainly going to have to be paid for by the better off. One of the problems he addresses is the problem in Western Europe of an aging population, a lower birth rate, a greater need for taxes, but fewer people paying into the tax system. I mean, certainly for the, the main continental European countries, there's quite a big issue there. I suppose I believe it, it's a bit exaggerated because economic output gets uh, created by capital as well as by people and, and that's even true of things like medical services and to, to some extent of, um, of education. You need workers of course but you also need other things like capital and so you can ensure that there's more output available in due course by building up capital by saving. So I do think that uh, these demographic changes imply that it, it it's rather important for the European economies to do more saving, and indeed some of them have moved over to doing that. But I think not, not rapidly enough. Not, they're not doing enough of that. But, uh, some of the birth rates are really remarkably low, mm. and uh, this will have a variety of effects. The, what people are worrying about now is the period when there will be a lot of retired people and not all that many people working. I must say that uh, I, I still think uh, while people might find themselves, um, an average person might be paying nearly half their income over taxes and so on, that's very different from paying 90%. Uh, and when you think what it's being paid for, health, education and pensions, uh, they, they seem rather valuable things. Yeah. So I, um, I think it's a little strange, people should be quite so troubled about that. But of course, I, this is against the backdrop of a situation where uh, the, these European economies have not been growing very fast. Incomes have been rising a little, but not a lot. I'd like to be able to say, well, you know, maybe what's going to happen is that uh, the, the workers in 20 years' time will not be able to spend more on the current consumption than workers today can do, which, after all, isn't bad. It's, it should be close to that. In other words, people will be spending more of their income on taxes in order to, to pay uh, current pensions. That part will grow quite a lot, so they'll look at the proportion and so on. I suppose I think that uh, people should uh, look back and think that, you know, am I, why should I be spending more on consumption than my parents, who were probably pretty happy. People may sense uh, what's at issue here. So suppose you were to increase savings substantially. This would be a way of putting down people's consumption now, like increase the taxes now rather than have them in the, in the future. Probably people have a, have a sense that that's what's at issue. And you shouldn't always think of things in terms of proportions. It's just absolutely saying, ah, oh, now it looks as though the current generation should now cut its standard of living significantly in order that its children should in the future be able to enjoy a standard of living at consumption level, probably quite a bit higher than, than the current generation. And I, I say that partly because I actually think that the rate of economic growth is going to accelerate again. It's not going to stay. I don't see why not. He moved on from talking about Western Europe to his time in India and the pitfalls of central economic planning. It became clear I wanted to be a development economist. I mean, say I, I wanted to work on the economics mm. of, of poor countries. I'd actually say that I, I don't think that was so much about narrowing the gap as, as about increasing their incomes, which means economic growth. So it's uh, really my prime interest. So it's very fortunate that I was able to, to go to India. 
that was uh, arranged for me by uh, Morty Sen, who's also a well, prize winner. Knew one another at that stage. I was just a research student. He was a young research fellow, but he had these contacts, and it was a marvelous opportunity to have to do with the Planning Commission. And I didn't feel that it was entirely useful for them. I, I suppose I had a, a, a real sense that I didn't know quite what to do. Looking back, I don't quite know why that should have been so, but you know there's a problem, you can see the, all the mm. poverty and so on, but it's quite another matter to know what you could do about it. I spent a lot of the year really trying to think my way through to that. I think it, it worked quite well, because I suppose I decided that the, the main issue was how people should decide what to do. But rather indirect, we got into the, the idea that uh, instead of planning, you should have a systematic way of deciding what kind of new projects to start. In other words, a much more piecemeal thing, much more like uh, uh, Western economy, mm -hmm. which at that stage India was, was not. Mm -hmm. India thought that you, you could actually deal with the uh, economic problem by... Uh, building a model and, and seeing what it said you should do. You can't just say do this and it happens. It uh, may happen in much too expensive and wasteful way. It actually took me a while to really understand how wasteful the whole process was. And as with other Nobel laureates, he gives us his advice on where he thinks students should go in the field, especially the new link between psychology and economics. It seems to me that the way that we reason and how that as uh, leads to what we do. Some of this sounds more like psychology than economics, but it, it's a very economic kind of activity. The, this involves the sort of information we get from others. I, I think that as yet we have not found good ways of measuring that uh, and recording that objectively. So I, I really believe that the, the development of uh, theories or, or models we want to call it a human behavior is just beginning um, but uh, there's a lot of scope both empirically in in doing descriptive measurement of, of things of, of a kind that people have simply not done up to now the way we form expectations the way we work out our decisions uh, that, that's just desperately needing to be done and it was actually a tremendous intellectual challenge in connecting these up with um, issues of economic policy of the kind that I was interested in about how taxes operate, how, how people respond to them. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps. There's really only one song we can close with as a tribute to Professor Merrilees. His field was optimal taxation, and the definitive song on optimal taxation was written by George Harrison in the mid-1960s when the Beatles were being taxed exorbitantly in Great Britain. I've always felt that George Harrison was underrated as a songwriter. If he hadn't been with the Beatles, he'd be recognized as one of the great rock and roll songwriters of our era. But unfortunately, he lives in the shadow of the incomparable songwriting team of Lennon and McCartney. And by the way, you saw this practically. In A Hard Day's Night, he actually wrote a couple of the songs that were featured in the movie. But in the credits, he got no songwriting credit. The songs were by Lennon and McCartney. In the same vein, the Beatles song that Frank Sinatra sang more than any other was something. And he always introduced it as a Lennon and McCartney tune, when in reality, it was a George Harrison tune. So we'll do our part to make up for that tonight for George Harrison, and also as a tribute to Professor Merrilee's on optimal taxation with George Harrison's classic, Tax man.